بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله hope everybody is doing well inshallah let's get started sorry today has been a pretty crazy day busy day for me so my apologies um, let me get to where we were Hope everybody's doing well. Ramadan, Mubarak, inshallah. I hope everyone is having a great Ramadan. Uh, inshallah, how's it going so far? You guys can let me know. Inshallah, I hope that it's uh, so far. It's very different than than what we're used to. Um, not as much uh, community engagement as we've we're used to, perhaps in the past. So how is everyone's Ramadan going, inshallah? Alhamdulillah. Good, good man. Good shayam. Inshallah, may Allah make it easy. Oh, man. Alhamdulillah, Ibrahim. That's awesome, man. Knocking out that juz. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah, mashallah. So alhamdulillah, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. So last time we were talking about al-akhirah. We said that al-akhirah is everything that starts from the moment of death. Um, and we were talking about the grave, sunu'adzibuhum marratain, as mentioned in Surah uh, At-Tawbah. And then we talked about the punishments of the grave and the bliss of the grave. And now we're talking about how to protect ourselves from the punishment of the grave. And we said first was to read Surah Tabarak at least daily. And of course, uh, Surah Al-Tabarak is the 67th chapter of the Quran. Tabarak al-Ladhi biyadihi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. MashaAllah. Very important chapter and very easy to memorize, MashaAllah. And then we mentioned that another way to um, bring about or protect ourselves from the punishment of the grave is charity. Uh, right? That, you know, charity will extinguish uh, for those who give it, uh, extinguish for them the, the, the heat, the punishment of the grave. Right? And that a person will, will find shade in the hereafter, one of the only places they'll find shade on the day when the sun is above everybody's head, we're going to talk about it. It's called Yom al-Hashar, is through their charity, mashallah. And this is where we stop talking about and 6.11 causes of the punishment in the grave. And we're going to mention only a few of them. We're not going to mention all of them. But the first is very important, especially now as you are entering adulthood, you're adults, and now many of you are going to be heading off to college, inshallah, and you know begin to forge the journey of your life. And one of the things that I can't emphasize enough is the importance of being an advocate for justice and being someone who um, is concerned about the rights of the marginalized and underserved. We know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he came back to Sayyidah Khadija Radiallahu Anha, and he told her what he saw, one of the things that she mentioned to him is that he helped the poor, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we are intrinsically tied as a prophetic community to the perennial values of justice. In fact, in Surah Al-Hadid, Allah says, وَلَقَدَ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانَ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطَ Allah says in Surah Al-Hadid, that we sent books and messengers so people could establish justice. So the purpose of sending prophets and books is justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تظلمون ولا تظلمون. Do not be oppressed and do not oppress others. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he would walk to the masjid, he would make this dua. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an uzlim aw uzlim alayhi. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from being an oppressor or oppressing others. 
And of course, you know now, the current political situation across the globe, it's crucial. Uh, it's prophetic that we stand with other communities and we, we stand for our own community most importantly. Um, there's a beautiful hadith Qudsi, ya ibadi inni haramtu zulma ala nafsi wa ja'alahu baynahu, baynahuma, baynahum muharaman fala tazaramu. Oh, my servants, I have made oppression haram for myself, Allah says. So I've made it also haram for you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if we think about oppression and justice, we don't want to restrict it only to the uh, communal uh, community aspects of justice. We can also expand it to say environmental justice. Have you ever thought about in the Quran when Fir'aun and his armies are defeated? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا بَكَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضِ That the heavens and the earth didn't weep for them. One of my teachers told me because they didn't know how to treat the heavens and the earth. So there was no ukhuwa. There was no fraternal bond between the environment and Fir'aun and his people because his people did not know how to treat the environment. Sayyidina Ibrahim, we know that a lizard, right? Uh, uh, sorry, Sayyidina uh, 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 Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to us that even the fish in the sea will make dua for the ma'allim khair for the one who teaches good. One great scholar, he said, because the person who understands religious knowledge will know how to treat the fish and to engage them. So when we talk about justice and helping the oppressed, we don't only restrict this to communal justice, we also want to think about environmental justice. Economic justice, we're going to be reading Surah Al-A'raf soon. We find, you know, Allah you know, don't cheat people, economic justice, and so on and so forth. So when you think about yourself as a member of the prophetic community, it's very important as you navigate the early contours of adulthood that you begin to think about how you can serve and be an ally to your own community as well as those who may need your help. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned how important this is in the hadith which is in front of us now. There is a man, he will be punished so severely in the grave that he will inquire of the angels, why am I being tormented in such a way? And they will say, You passed by someone being oppressed and you didn't help them. Now we can understand the story of Sayyidina Musa, right? Not, not the one that we talked about before, but in Surah Al-Kahf, right? Because in Surah Al-Kahf, he does three things which are quite strange, right? He meets Sayyidina Khadr, alayhi salam, and as they're walking, they see a young boy, and Khadr, he kills the young boy, and, you know, Musa says, like, you kill somebody. He knocks a hole in somebody's boat and sinks it. Sayyidina Musa asks him about that. He... Um, he built the wall and didn't didn't receive payment for it. In those three situations, I want you to think about something that we talked about earlier about prophets. It is impossible for Sayyidina Musa to mute himself in the face of any of those three things because they constitute injustice and a prophet will never be quiet in the face of injustice. So the death of a young person, somebody's property being destroyed, and then even someone not receiving a fair wage, it is impossible for Sayyidina Musa to remain silent. So to be Muslim means that you have to align yourself with the call of justice. And here, very scary hadith. You pass by a person being oppressed and you did not help them. The next is failing to clean ourselves properly from urine and feces. The Prophet mentioned the person's being punished in the grave. He said, Like you prayed without purifying yourself. 
Third is to slander people and to spread false information and to try to create trouble. And the Prophet Sallallahu one time he was walking in a graveyard and he pointed at two graves and he said, Innahuma la yu'adhabani. These, these two occupants are being punished. Wa ma yu'adhabani fi kabirin. And not for something that you would consider major. Amma ahaduhuma fakana la yistanzihu min al the first, he didn't protect himself from, like he didn't purify himself from urine. Yeah, like backbiting. And the last one is someone who used to, not only backbite, Namima is worse than backbiting. Backbiting falls under this, but Namima is like, if I went to you and I said, man, Shayan Ibrahim said this stuff about you, so that I could create trouble between you. That's called Naman and Namima. And the Prophet said, Anamam la yadkhulu jannah. Prophet said that the Naman will not enter paradise. So yes, like a like a person who 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 is backbiting, but now not only am I backbiting, I may even be telling the truth, but I'm doing it to create trouble amongst people. This is called Namima. So backbiting falls under that as well. The, the, the next thing that we believe in is called Asirat. And this is mentioned in the Quran. Allah says, Fahduhum ila sirat al jahim. And the 37th chapter of the Quran, I believe, at verse 23. Imam al Bukhari mentions this hadith, this in a long hadith of Abu Sa'id al Khudri. Said that the Prophet was asked by the companions about this verse, What is sirat? He responded, It is a slippery bridge. And on it, there are clamps and hooks like a thorny seed that is wide at one side and narrow at the other, and it has thorns with bent ends. He says, some believers will cross the bridge as quickly as the wink of an eye, some as quickly as lightning, some as strong wind, some as fast horses, and some as she camels. So some will be safe without any harm, some will secure, be secure after receiving some injury, and some will fall down into hell. The last person will be crossed. The last person to cross will actually be dragged, subhanAllah. Allah mentions the sirat in the Quran. He says, فَهْدُوهُمْ إِلَىٰ صِرَاطِ الْجَحِيمِ Guide them to the path of hell. The next is the scales. And of course, these are not like the scales you and I have in front of us now. Allah alam the reality of these scales, but we know that there are two. Allah mentions in numerous places in the Quran, and specifically here in chapter 21, verse 47, yeah, so here for this whom is talking about the, the disbelievers, man. Here's not talking about the Muslims. So the strong opinion is that people who cross the Surat will go into paradise, Shayan. But in, in our third course, and this, in this, uh, uh, this is just an introductory course, but on our third course in this subject, we actually have an entire course, actually it's the fifth course, sorry, just dedicated to the hereafter. And we go through all of the details of it, mashallah. It's very cool, man, very interesting. So the scales, after a person has been interrogated, his deeds will be measured in front of him. If his good outweigh his bad, and he was a believer, and Allah blesses him, he will experience bliss. If not, then his case is left to Allah, to Allah to punish him or to forgive him. Excuse me. Scholars state that the scales are two scales whose reality, their physical reality, is only known to Allah alone. They are mentioned in the Quran, And we place the scales of justice for the Day of Judgment. So no soul will be treated unjustly at all. And even if there is even the weight of a mustard seed, we'll bring it forth, like meaning the most minuscule. And I actually don't like it when they translate things like this. What it should say is, and the most, most you know, minuscule deeds will be brought forth. And sufficient 
are we as an accountant? I mean, nothing will escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no deeds that we've done. This is also mentioned in a very beautiful hadith from Imam Ahmed, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Allah the Almighty will choose a man from my community, from the ummah, on the day of judgment, and 99 books will be opened before that person. Each one spanning a distance as far as the eyes can see. Allah will say to him as the books are open, do you remember that sin? Have my scribes, the angels who recorded your deeds been unjust? He will say, no, my Lord, they have not. Allah will say to him, do you have any excuse for yourself? He will respond, no, my Lord. Suddenly, Allah will say to him, you do have one good deed that I'm aware of. And this day you will not be wronged. And a small piece of paper, it's a better translation, will be presented and written on it is Ashhadu an la ilaha illallahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. Then, which means I testify that there's no God except Allah and that Muhammad is a servant and messenger. Then Allah will say, present the scales. And the man will ask fearly, my Lord, what is on that card? And what are all these books? And Allah will say to him, this day you will not be judged. You will not be treated unjustly. Then he subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, place the books on one scale on this paper on another. And the scale with the paper on it will be heavier, subhanAllah, because of la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. How can we add weight to our scales? Like, how can we add good to our scales? This is a very beautiful hadith, very easy to memorize. It's the last hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. Kalimatani habibatani ila rahmani khafifatani ala lisani thaqilatani fil mizani subhanallahi wa bihamdihi subhanallahi al-azim. Which means there are two phrases that are beloved to the most merciful, meaning Allah easy and light on the tongue and heavy in the scales I mean heavy and good in ajr and reward what is it subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah al azim subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah al azim it takes us now to a discussion about jannah it's important to note that belief in jannah is fard What's called ma'lum min ad-din bidurura. Ma'lum min ad-din bidurura means what is known by necessity from the deen. Like everybody knows it. Like everyone knows. You can ask a child, you can ask an older person that we believe in Jannah. It is an obligation for you to believe in paradise. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a sound hadith, wa anna al-jannata haqqun wa anna al-nara haqqun that paradise is a fact and that hell is a fact. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is Jannah? Paradise is a reward granted by Allah to those who believed in Him and struggled to live faithful lives. It is from His fadl, His blessings, from those what we call mumkinat, maybe, maybe not. It's not an obligation to give anyone Jannah. It's not an obligation to give anyone hell. That's a fadl from Allah. A blessing to those who believe. There are different levels of Jannah. There are eight gates of Jannah that we'll talk about in the future, inshallah, in other classes. But there are seven levels of Jannah mentioned in the Quran. And of course, each one has a greater degree of blessings and rewards. Let me ask you a question. Which one of those levels of Jannah did the Prophet wasallam say we should ask for? Which one of those levels of Jannah did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Ida Sa'altallah al Jannah? If you ask Allah, Ida Sa'altallah al Jannah. Here's my question, right? Awesome, mashallah, Musa, mashallah, I see you, AD. Stay on holding it down. Firdaus al A'la, Musa, great. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said, Ask for, yeah, those are in order. When he asked for, when you ask for, for, for Jannah, ask for Firdaus. He wasn't just talking to righteous people, right? There were people in front of him, they weren't so good. There were people in front of him who struggled. There were people in front of him who were really good. Why would the Prophet وسلم, uh, tell people who are struggling, if you ask for Jannah, ask for Firdaus? 
Like, why? Like, can you imagine if you're that guy that was struggling with your deen? Or you're that woman that's struggling with your deen? And the Prophet ﷺ said to you, even though he knew you were struggling, ask for fiddles. How would that make you feel, man? So here we see something. Have you ever been around people who like they use religion? Yeah, exactly, Maria. Like to to like imagine how you'd feel, man, if you were struggling, if you were like having some challenges in, in, in your deen, and still the Prophet وسلم, told you, Ya Maria, ask for fados. Musa, ask for fados. Even though you knew you had like ratchetness man imagine how that would soften the heart of a person if sayyidina muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to them ask for the highest ask to be with me sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know there was a sahabi he uh he used to attend the lectures of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with with consistency and he, he would go home and he would get sad. So he came to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, when I'm with you, I become so, so happy when I see you, when I hear you, when you talk with me, I feel like my Iman is so strong. Then when I go home and I return to like my, my normal habits, I realize that like I'm not as good as you are. So I worry that I won't be with you in Jannah. So he said, actually, I weep because I won't be in Jannah with you. Like if I make it to Jannah, I won't make it to your where you are. So I become sad. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Mar'u Ma'aman Ahab. You'll be with who you love. When I was in Egypt in Al Azhar, I wrote a poem about this. Jannati Bidunik Naru. You know, my Jannah without you is hell. Like this Sahabi saying, you know, to be in Jannah without being Bijambi Sayyidina Muhammad, without being next to you is like hell. SubhanAllah. So the Prophet ﷺ, he used to say to the Sahaba, regardless of how good or bad they were, Ask for fiddos. Have you ever been about, around people who use religion to make you feel insecure? Have you ever been around people who use religion to intimidate you? There's a difference between motivation and intimidation, right? Have you ever seen sometimes religious people, they're mean? What happened to them? Did they forget that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ask for fados. Aim high. Subhanallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So fados al-a'la. Then the second is al-ma'wa. Al-ma'wa is mentioned in Surah Al-Sajda. Al-Khulud is mentioned in Surah Al-Qaf. Al-Na'im is mentioned in Al-Ahqaf. Adan is mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf. Dar al-Salam, Surah Al-Yunus. In Darul Jalal. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yaj'alna min ahla janna wa yudkhilna fi jannatihi bi ghayr al-hisab. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from ahla janna, inshaAllah, people of jannah. Inshallah, in the, in, we actually have a course where we spend almost a month going through all of these. SubhanAllah. So, so amazing, mashallah. So amazing. A question that a lot of young people ask me is were Adam and his wife actually in Jannah? That's a question because there is an opinion that you find among some scholars that the Jannah that Adam and his wife in was different than Al-Jannah. But the strong opinion is that it's the same because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Jannah in the hereafter, he always uses Alif Lam, Al-Jannah. And when he talked to Adam and his wife, he says, Al Jannah, Ud Khurul Jannah, Ud Khurul Jannah. That's a good question. So the strong opinion is that if you're here in the seventh level, 
uh, Shayan is asking, can you move around? Can you go like visit different parts of Jannah? So if you're here, this is where you're going to stay. But if you're in the sixth, you can visit the seventh. If you're in the fifth, you can visit the sixth and the seventh. If you're in the fourth, you can visit the fifth, the sixth, and seventh, and so on and so forth. Another question that people ask me that's very important is, will they be able to be with their families in Jannah? Like, let's say you're here and you, your parents are here. Yeah, only seven levels, as mentioned in authentic hadith and, and found in the Quran. And let's say, like, am I going to be with my family? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah uh, At-Tur, verse, uh, I can't remember the verse, وَالَّذِينَ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقَنَا بِذُرِّيَّتِهِمْ That we are going to unite families of faith together in Jannah. No, no, Ahmed, once you enter Jannah, alhamdulillah. That's why it's called Al-Khulud. You're not going to go out, inshallah. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, alhamdulillah. So you can unite with your, your family, alhamdulillah, in Jannah. In fact, Ibn Abbas, he said, there'll be some, some family members who are like here, say like Dar Salam, hypothetically, and there's other, other families in Fardos, and the other families will ask Allah to join them. And you find this in Surah Al-Tur, their dua is mentioned. And they'll be brought together. And even some of the dua of people of Jannah for their families will bring their other family members from hell, bi'iznillah. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. This takes us to the discussion about hellfire. As a Muslim, you must believe in hell. Hell is a punishment of Allah for those who believed but committed sins and evil. Or those who rejected faith, they'll eventually be evacuated from there to heaven. Those people, so let me read it again. As a Muslim, you must believe that hell in hell, hell is a punishment of Allah for those who believed and committed, but committed sins and evil and didn't repent. They will eventually be evacuated from there to heaven. As mentioned in authentic hadith, it is also an eternal punishment for those who die knowing and rejecting Allah by disbelieving in him. The Prophet said, after you pray the dawn prayer, say, Allah, it's very nice. Allahumma ajirni minan nar. Allahumma ajirni minan nar. Allahumma ajirni minan nar. Oh Allah, save me from hellfire. When I first started learning Arabic, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, I was traveling with my teacher. I was in Kuwait. And uh, I said, Allahumma ja'alni minan nar. Allahumma ja'alni minan nar. Allahumma ja'alni minan nar. Oh Allah, make me from hell. He said, <laughs> He said, don't say that, man. Allahumma ajirni. Ajirni, save me from hellfire. Sab'a marrat. Prophet said, whoever prays Salatul Fajr and says it seven times, فَإِنَّكَ إِمِتَّ مِنْ يَوْمِكَ ذَارِكَ كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَكَ جِوَارًا مِنَ النَّارِ If you say that, you passed away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save you from hell. وَإِذَا صَلَيْتَ الْمَغْرِبَ فَقُلْ قَبْلَ أَن تَكَلَّمَ أَحَدًا مِنَ النَّاسِ Allahumma ajirni min nari sab'a marrat. And the same thing when you pray Maghrib before you talk to anyone, say, huh? Oh Allah, save me from hell seven times. If you die on that evening, inshallah, also you'll be degreed that you'll be saved from hellfire. Yeah, we can take questions now, inshallah. We have a few minutes left and we'll continue on Friday. Yes. Not necessarily, Omar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we talked about this before. Like, Dua can be answered in this life or in the hereafter, right? So it's possible that it can be answered now, but also it's possible it can be answered in the hereafter. There's actually a really beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who says that a person will make dua for something and Allah will not answer that person. They keep making dua, keep making dua. And the malaika will say, oh Allah, answer Omar's dua, for example. And Allah will say, Da'u, leave him, I love to hear his voice. And in that narration, it mentions that that person, subhanAllah, they will be given better in the hereafter, inshallah. Amen. 
are all of the du'as you're supposed to say after salah supposed to be said after the fard or after you are done with the sunnah and the entire prayer? After the fard, like after the fard. I mean, you could ask for those kind of things, but again, you know, we know from other narrations and texts, like Allah is not going to give you superpowers, man. So, you know, you could ask in Jannah, Allah, give me the, 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 you know, the superpowers, but inshallah, in this life, uh, nah, man, ain't gonna happen. You could ask, but it's not gonna happen. It won't happen, bro. But you can ask for, uh, for it in, in Jannah, inshallah. Don't get upset, man. Are you DC or Marvel? That's the bigger question. Are you DC or Marvel? The DC or the Marvel Universe? That's the bigger question, mashallah. Any other questions <laughs> before? Uh, so there is a hadith of the Prophet says something, Iman, that says three things happen when we make dua, or four. One is that it could be answered. Number two is that Allah answers it with something else which is better for us. Number three is that by making dua, harm is removed from us. And number four is that it's answered in the hereafter, inshallah. Maria, so we talked about that before, right? We talked about that very early on. I think in the first or second class. Can you imagine we only have like a week left, subhanAllah, of this class. Um, that a a person who does not know is going to be judged by Allah with his mercy and justice. But a person, I think May 8th is when we stop and then we'll come back after May 8th. So a little over a week. And then we'll take a break for Eid and then we'll start with the stories of the prophets, inshallah ta'ala. Um, so, so there's a difference between someone who openly rejects and someone who doesn't know, right? We talked about that before, mashallah. You can find it in the first or second lecture. Uh, a question from Alina, mashallah. My brother leads Tarawi. How do I correct him if I see mistakes? No, no. So the opinion of Imam Malik is you can say subhanallah. And if he makes mistakes in Quran, you can correct him. So if he makes a mistake in Quran, you should correct him. The Quran has a haqq upon all of us. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a sound hadith, he was walking by someone's home and he heard a woman reading, Hal ataka hadith al -ghashiyah. And he said, atatni al -ghashiyah. He said, yes, ghashia came to me and he didn't correct her. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he didn't tell her also, stop reading the Quran. This is some nonsense. People say women can't read the Quran if they read the Quran. If people find women reading the Quran as like some kind of like bad thing, what's wrong with those people, man? Like, how do you see bad in that? Absolutely not. A woman's voice is not aura. Whoever said this is foolish. You know, Alina, one of my teachers I studied with, one of my sheikha, I'll, I'll, send, I'll put the video, if I can find it, I'll put the video in your classroom. You can see me, I'm reading hadith to one sheikha in, in Morocco. She's a female scholar, she's old. But subhanAllah, one of my teachers used to say, in kanat sultan aura, if, if, if the voice of a woman is aura, how do we have the hadith of Aisha? How do we have the hadith of Um Salama? How do we have all the prophetic narrations of women if their voices are awra, meaning that they have to hide their voices? If women's voices are awra, why in the Quran does Allah quote women? قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهُ So th this is some insecure nonsense, man. There's no evidence whatsoever Patriarchy, right? Insecure people. But there's nothing in the Quran and Sunnah that says a woman's voice is aura. Allahu Akbar. Abadan, 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 abadan. Abadan. There's a difference between like, you know, filthy talk, enticing talk, and dhikr and Quran. Like, how, how, would it, how it must feel to be a girl to be told that you can't even read the Quran. But the Qur'an is light. There's a difference between Lil Pump and the Qur'an. Or whatever these, Lil, all these Lils, right? There's a difference between the Qur'an and that. But we're going to tell young women you can't even read the Qur'an. La hawla wa la quwata illa bil'ali azim. That is a bid'ah. That is like such a bad thing to tell people that, subhanAllah. Any other questions before we, before we jump off, inshaAllah? 
So then, inshallah, on Friday, we're going to pick up. I'll have your exams hopefully done by Friday or Saturday. Uh, it's a lot of them, mashallah. And then we're going to start talking about the levels of hell. Great to see you guys as always. Ramadan Mubarak. Ah, man. The voice of a woman is not a distraction unless somebody can't control himself. Why can't the ears of the guy hearing her voice be the, he's the one who's the distraction. You know, in the malamado biniyat. So there's a difference between like a woman or even a man who's like talking in a filthy way or saying something inappropriate. And just people talking or reading the Quran or making dhikr. It's not the same thing. Fabarakallahu feekum. Jazakum Allahu khairan. You guys have a wonderful day. Make dua for us at iftar, and I will see you Friday, inshallah, at 4.15. Assalamu alaikum. Omar, I see you, man. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.